Hi there guys, this is the MPC Home Cinema Design Guide Part 1. Please make sure to like and subscribe as it really helps us to continue making this content for you. In this video I'm going to be talking over some room basics with you and also just going through some of the key points on selecting a screen and a projector for your home cinema. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it, I'm pumped. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay man, let's do it! So the first thing I want to talk about is room layout. In the very early stages of your design process, there are a number of things to consider about the room that can drastically improve the end result for you. The first one I want to talk about is the room size and shape. Now, in an ideal world, it may seem that, you know, by having a square room, something that is equal on all sides would actually be good for cinema to be consistent. But in the real world, the way that sound works means that actually avoiding symmetrical rooms is an advantage. It's science. Ideally, you want a room that is wider than it is long, or vice versa, or a really weird, oddly shaped room will actually generally provide a better result than a square. The other thing to consider with the room type in general and just the way that the room looks is where the doors and windows are. The last thing you want is to get to the audio specification stage and have to move speakers to sub-optimal positions because you've got a door or a window where that speaker would need to go. So think about in which way you're going to put the cinema in the space to maximize your ability to put speakers where they need to go. Now, once you've decided on your room layout, what do you think the first thing you should be specifying is? Is it the screen? No! Is it the projector? No! God, please, no! Is it the speakers? No! The answer is seating. And let me tell you why. By specifying your seating first, you allow all of the other kit within the cinema to be specified a hell of a lot more easily. By specifying anything else first, you are just making your job more difficult. Be sure to consider your seating before any other factor. What do you mean by choosing your seating correctly? Well, the first thing you wanna do is decide on the primary use of the room. Often people have an idea in their minds about what they want their cinema to be, but in reality, you find that when you thought you might be having 10 friends over every week, it's actually primarily just two or three or maybe even four people using the cinema. And then the rest of that space is pretty much wasted. And more importantly, a lot of your budget may have gone into extra seating that you didn't actually need to spend out on. Try and consider maybe reducing the number of seats that you go for, the main seating, and maybe replacing that with flexible seating, such as bean bags. We're seeing that a hell of a lot more in the projects that we work on, where bean bags are actually reducing the overall budget of the cinema, but still allowing for all of the socialization and events and stuff when it happens. Whereas for the majority of the time, the core seats that you've put into the room are all getting a really, really good experience. But bean bags, when I talk about all of the seats getting a good experience, the next thing I wanna come on to is um, um, well, we're waiting. Um, the positioning of the seats. Now, in cinema design, we build all cinemas calibrating around a single point. We call that the sweet spot or the king's chair. It's where the owner of the cinema essentially decides where they are going to sit. And you can only calibrate a room to one position. With, with new room correction technology, modern room correction technology with your audio video receiver, you can make the sound better for more seats, but this is something that you do after you've designed the cinema properly. It's not something that you build your cinema based on the fact that you're just gonna correct it later. Make sure that you put your seats as close to the sweet spot as you can and try and keep your seats as much as possible away from any walls. The closer you get to walls, the worse the experience is going to be for the people sitting next to the walls. I appreciate that in most homes this isn't going to be possible, but if you can get any separation from walls, then I advise that you do it because this is going to drastically improve the experience for all seats as opposed to just the king's chair. Did not see that coming. One more thing to consider with the seating is try and choose materials for your seats that are not going to be bouncy and reflective. We do that by maybe choosing faux suede for your seating instead of leather and avoiding, like I say, metal and wood. That's it for seating. So next I want to talk about screens. Okay, boys, here we go. Now, once you've selected your seats, the next logical step 
is to go down specifying a screen. Now the first thing, the most important thing with specifying a screen is don't just go for the biggest screen that you possibly can fit on the wall. You know, maybe he's compensating for something. <laughs> because ultimately, I don't know if you've ever been to a commercial cinema and you've sat right at the front because you couldn't get seats further back and you have been looking upwards and you're looking right and left, craning your neck to try and see the content that's on screen and experience it. That is not an experience we want in a home cinema. So I would advise that where possible, you go for a screen that fits within your frontal field of vision. Now, depending on the ratio of screen that you choose, you will want to try and keep that field of vision at a maximum of between 35 and 45 degrees. So from your center point, 35 degrees outwards or 45 degrees outwards within that area is where the, the, the sweet spot for size of screen is from where your main seating position is. This will mean that you will have comfortable viewing. You won't be turning your head to get to, to watch content. I understand that you want the biggest screen as, as, po as possible, but in a lot of cases that actually leads to a bad experience. So make sure that you choose the screen based on the seat. The next point I wanna cover with screens is that you need to choose the ratio of your screen based on content. When I talk about ratio, I'm talking about the shape of the screen based on the content that you watch. Now, everyone uh, who's watching this will probably be familiar with TV format screens, which is 16 by nine. That is TV ratio. So that wide by that big. Of course. And that for the most part is the content that comes through your television. So it's broadcast TV, it's sports, those are the kind of things that come in a 16 by nine format. The other option that you have as far as screens is a two, three, five to one format, which essentially is what we call widescreen or cinema scope or letterbox mode. If you're watching on a TV, you'll be familiar with the black bars top and bottom. Now that is the format that over 90% of movies are still made in, which you know, if you are a movie fanatic, you're somebody that's gonna be watching movies in your cinema primarily over anything else, then I would advise that you go for a two, three, five ratio screen because that is going to provide you with the biggest possible screen for the majority of the content that you're watching. Conversely, if you are someone who watches a lot of broadcast, a lot of streaming and a lot of sports, then a 16 by nine ratio screen is going to be the better option for you. And then you can just deal with black bars top and bottom when you're watching movie content. Um, the opposite is the same for 235. You're just going to have to deal with large black bars right and left and watch a movie in the center of the large screen when you want to watch broadcasted TV or sport content. For those of you with a little extra budget though, you can get something called an auto masking screen which has automatic masks that come in and make the screen ratio whatever you need it to be for the content and makes the screen frame look nice and uniform and it massively adds to the experience of watching whatever content it is you want to watch. So if you do have a little bit extra money in the budget, and I mean maybe a lot of extra money in the budget, consider an auto masking screen. The final thing I want to talk about with screens is the material. Now, um, when I talk about screen material, you you have to go back and talk about cinema design in general. When you go to a commercial cinema, you are watching a movie with speakers that are set behind the screen. When we design home cinemas properly, you should be aiming to put your speakers behind the screen uh, for the front channels. Now, in doing that, you're going to need an acoustically transparent screen material. And there are two different types of those. You've got your micro perforated screens and you've got your woven screens. Micro perforated screens are cheaper, woven screens are more expensive, but they let differing levels of sound through. I have been involved in the design of cinemas where after calibration, the speakers that are behind the, uh, the micro perf screen have lost nearly half their sound. If you do have a large budget for your cinema and you're spending whatever money it is on the speakers, you wanna make sure that you're getting 100% from them or at least as close as possible to 100% from them. Bear in mind that the difference in price between a micro perforated screen and a woven screen may be better value for you overall than choosing more expensive speakers over less expensive speakers. You could get a better result by spending in the right places as opposed to just throwing all of your money into more powerful speakers. That's it for screens. Next, I'm going to talk about projection. Now, there is a hell of a lot that goes into choosing the right projector, but I'm gonna try and condense it down into just four main points that you need to consider when going out shopping for a projector of your own. Point number one is going to be compatibility. Your projector needs to be compatible with three main things. It needs to be compatible with 4K resolution, it needs to be compatible with HDR, and it needs to be compatible with HLG. <clears throat> 
Those three formats, see them as tick boxes. They're just things that you're looking for. It doesn't necessarily matter about the technical side of things at this point. You just need to make sure that your projector accepts those formats. Um, whether it can deliver those formats is a totally other matter that's extremely technical and we could probably debate it for hours. The most important thing is that you're getting a 4K projector that's got HDR and HLG. Done. Second, take a look at the brightness. Now when I say brightness, and you need to look for the label that says ANSI Lumen Output. Now the ANSI Lumens is actually the metric that we use for judging the brightness of a projector. That doesn't necessarily mean though that what you, the brightness that you get out is what brightness you're going to get back from the screen. There's a lot of science that goes into calculating the right lumen output for your cinema. But as a general rule of thumb, you need to be looking for a projector for a dedicated cinema room such as the one I'm sitting in now where you can darken it to complete black. You need to be looking for something around 1500 to 1800, maybe anything up to 2200 lumens. Whereas if you're looking to put your uh, cinema in a space that's going to have any ambient light, if you want to watch it with the lights on, if you want to have sunlight coming through the window, you need to be looking for something in excess of 3000 or as much brightness as you can possibly get. You have to bear in mind that the more brightness you want, the more power you're going to need, which means the more money you're going to have to spend. Say money can't buy happiness. Look at that fucking smile on my face. The third point that I want to talk about with projection is making sure that you've got a projector with advanced calibration. Now I'm talking about two different schools of calibration, the ISF calibration and THX calibration. It can have either. It can have both one or the other doesn't really matter the important thing is is that a professional if he got his hands on this projector would be able to calibrate it to deliver the movie as the director intended if, if you don't have advanced calibration on your projector it's probably not been designed for home cinema which means that it's probably not suitable for delivering the best quality at the end most projectors now will have one of the two if, you, if it's a proper home cinema projector if in an ideal world, you know, one is not better than the other, so don't worry about that. Just choose one that's got advanced calibration if you can. You will tend to pay a little bit more for it, but like I say, it's all down to what you can fit within your budget. One piece of advice I would just say is don't underspend on projection. There's a lot of stuff online. I mean, you know, every single promotion I see for projection is basically a rendered image of what the image could look like in your home, but actually the realistic um, you know, light output of that projector is nowhere near what that image suggests. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors around uh, around promoting projectors or marketing projectors. So bear that in mind, you know, you need to just be going for that light output and make sure it's got some advanced calibration. In addition to that, um, I just want to talk about lens shift for a second. Lens shift um, is essentially a feature that comes on some projectors which allows you to move the whole lens within the body of the projector in order to fit the image properly within your projector screen. If you don't have that function, you are typically reduced to doing something called keystone correction, which involves manipulating the image and bending the image. That is not something we condone doing at all. Keystoning is the main cause of pictures looking terrible. So please make sure wherever you can to get a projector that has lens shift. Um, and as long as you've spec'd it right in the other areas as well, you will have no problems when it comes to install time. Also, just to touch on other features uh, within calibration, lens memory is more of a experience-led uh, feature that is really, really good because what it can allow you to do is set memorized uh, settings for your projector, which means that when you choose a particular piece of content, it can auto change the screen or auto set your projector so that you are, you're not having to press multiple buttons in order to get the image to display as you expect it to. Um, it's the same kind of technology as if you were driving in a Mercedes or a BMW or a high-end high -end car and you have a seat memory, you know, rather than getting into your seat after your partner or your wife or your girlfriend has driven it and having to change it, you know, further back and lean back and change the lumbar support, you just press a button and it goes to the exact seating position that you desire that that's very much the same kind of experience if you want that little luxury and you don't want to have to be messing around with projector controls and everything lens memory is a great thing to opt for but it will carry a higher price in general for the projectors that have that feature so bear that in mind the final thing i want to talk about is throw ratio now this is again something i don't want to get too technical about right now this is something you have to do a calculation for but the best thing to do is just to go to a website where they have a screen and throw ratio calculator i've linked one in the description here um, this is the best one that we found online and we use it all the time for our projects 
it is pretty much a foolproof way to make sure that you pick a projector that has that absolute right throw ratio for your room. That's it for part one, guys. Please make sure that you like and subscribe to our channel. Um, we're also on all of the other socials, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, everything. So feel free to follow us on all of those and uh, we'll see you next time.